we uh, ended the lect lecture, last lecture with a reference to Philip Melanchthon and lecture 22 in our handout church history, Philip Melanchthon and Lutheran slippage. Number one, we all know that the not too funny joke that the man is the head of the family and the wife the neck, but it's the neck that turns the head. Uh, however pleasant or unpleasant that familiar aphorism about domestic relationships may be, there was something like that between Luther and Melanchthon. Luther was the head, but as we saw in this last episode, Melanchthon was able to turn the head on certain occasions, and Melanchthon was in virtual awe of Luther and sat at his feet in a very real sense. At the same time, he was able to even change Luther, never fundamentally, but certainly to move the Lutheran tradition, which had an awe of Martin Luther, they never had of Philip Melanchthon. We see how that happened in later development too. It was something like that in Melanchthon's relation to Luther. He not only helped Luther, but was in awe of him. That's the reason he hesitated to make suggestions and wouldn't dare to differ with Luther face to face, one on one, not as a coward so much, just that he felt that instinctively that Luther must be right because he had such a great admiration for the stature of the reformer. Three, nevertheless, as we have seen, it was probably Melanchthon and not Luther who turned the German Reformation against the Swiss, causing the first great division in Protestantism. Four, it was also Melanchthon and not Luther who wrote the first Lutheran systematic theology, loci communi, commonplaces, was the first Protestant theology, 1521, a good 15 years prior to Calvin's theology. And it was Melanchthon who negotiated with Roman Catholicism at Augsburg in 1530, though Luther was in the background keeping his associate in line. So we mustn't underestimate the influence of this man, even while Luther was alive and definitely dominating the Reformation in northern Germany and in Scandinavia and other places where it was rapidly expanding and so on, that uh, Luther uh, was the head, but to a great degree the neck was turning that uh, head even while Luther was alive and even while Melanchthon was afraid really to do what he was succeeding as, as it were without trying. Number five, nevertheless, Melanchthon never agreed with Luther's profound Augustinianism, though he never dared differ with him openly while Luther lived. Luther was predestinarian, as I say, from the very beginning. And as far as we can see, predestinarian, I'll say, as far as we can see, Philip Melanchthon never was. Melanchthon was a Renaissance figure, kind of an Erasmian figure, and he never really got over it. And as long as Luther was alive, he couldn't bring himself to differ openly with Luther on this subject, which to him was appallingly wrong. In the mind of Philip Melanchthon, it seems from the very beginning, predestination and fatalism were synonymous, and neither one of them was Christian. And yet there was no doubt that his hero, Martin Luther, was a predestinarian and of the strongest, inflexible variety of predestinarian. You can feel here for Philip Melanchthon. Here he is almost inextricably attached to a man is teaching a doctrine as a central verity, which is absolutely objectionable to Melanchthon. But he couldn't bring it up. He couldn't differ, not because he lacked conviction, not because he didn't think that he could probably prove his point, just it seems like a psychological phenomenon. 
He just was so captivated by Luther that he couldn't bring himself to oppose him, and it's quite possible psychologically that he couldn't believe in the depths of his melanth Melanchthonian heart that Luther could be wrong on something as basic as that. But at any rate, Luther went to his death in 1546 without getting a direct opposition from Philip Melanchthon, even though Melanchthon disagreed with him fundamentally. Six. After Luther's death in 46, immediately and openly, Melanchthon differed, and Lutheranism gradually slipped back to medieval semi-Augustinianism called semi-Pelagianism. Here the Lutheran group as a whole are rather interested, and they still, to this day, the Lutherans have a veneration for Martin Luther that makes you think Luther was still alive. It's very great. We Calvinists have a great admiration for Calvin, but I don't think it is anything like the degree in which the Lutherans, the Orthodox Lutherans, hold uh, Martin Luther, and he can keep them in line. I think, for example, this matter of the ordination of women. The Calvinistic churches have been moving steadily in the direction of receiving that in spite of the teaching of John Calvin. Lutherans are notoriously slow about it, very reluctant, and very little progress is yet, partly because, and I would guess mainly because, Martin Luther was so vehemently against it. And nobody who remembers Luther uh, can do, uh, can actually advocate female ordination without realizing that bring the thunder of the reformer down on them. I may be quite wrong about this, but it seems to me that the Orthodox Lutherans, the Luther Lutherans, have a reverence for Martin Luther that the Calvinistic Calvinists had never had and certainly don't have today for John Calvin, even though they admire him uh, tremendously and when they feel inclined to differ with him, are very reluctant and circumspect and examine themselves very carefully, as I would, for example, suspecting that they're wrong if they differ with Calvin, not because he's inspired, but because he's such a fine theologian, made so few errors in our opinion, that the likelihood when we differ from him is that we're mistaken and not that he was mistaken. That attitude exists in any tradition which had a great reverence for its leader, but as I, in my opinion, there's nothing in the Christian church like the reverence which the Orthodox Lutheran seems to have for Martin Luther. Well, you'd say a Roman Catholic has it for the Pope, yes, but that's because the Pope has an office different from any Protestant teacher. He is deemed infallible in his office. He's the Holy Father according to that particular status. It's not quite the same thing as being fascinated, as it were, by the individual himself as a particular teacher in distinction from his office, which may be deemed supreme and in actually uh, infallible. Now, I'm saying here that after the death of uh, uh, Luther, while the Lutherans were still with him and uh, they were very suspicious of Melanchthon because he seemed to vacillate on the Lord's Supper and they use this term crypto-Calvinist for Melanchthonians, meaning that they were secret Calvinists, but they're usually thinking about the Eucharist when they say that. They didn't feel that uh, Melanchthon was as thoroughgoing in his consubstantiationism as Martin Luther uh, was, and that uh, there was therefore a sort of hidden uh, sympathy with Calvinists that uh, the standard Lutheran wouldn't have because of the Calvinistic difference on consubstantiation. But in another way, the Lutherans who uh, inherited uh, Martin Luther's uh, mantle were uh, uh, more sympathetic with Melanchthon, though I don't think they were aware of it. We've already seen that, uh, I think at one time I mentioned the fact that uh, Melanchthon tended to be synergistic. That is, he believed that in the conversion of a soul, the sinner worked together with God in the production of a new nature, synergistic. Uh, 
Luther was clearly monergistic, as we indicated with respect to his predestinarian thinking. No, no, no. God alone brings a soul alive, and then, once alive, the soul works with Christ. But see, Melanchthon would see that which grows consistently and inevitably out of predestinarian thinking as a real threat to true evangelism, which leaves a role for the individual to play. He must cooperate with the Spirit, and if he doesn't cooperate with the Spirit, there's got going to be any regeneration. No predestination makes it possible for a person to come to God without cooperating with God. Now, at this point, you see, and Melanchthon is clearly synergistic. Luther is even more clearly monergistic. The people after 1546 are solidly with Luther. They suspect Melanchthon when he differs with him, and when he seems to be less devoted to consubstantiation, the estrangement with Melanchthon becomes uh, notable, and yet here is something incomparably more important than this other matter where anybody ought to be able to see that Melanchthon is differing from Luther at a very vital point in Luther's thinking, that he's actually introducing an idea that was repugnant to Luther and incompatible with the indisputable predestinarianism of Luther. But this is where the slippage is coming in. I sometimes put it this way. There's Lutherism, and there's Luther and ism. There's a hyphen in there. Here, if you're a real Lutherist, you're really with Luther, you'd have to be consubstantiationist, and you'd have to be monergistic. Uh, people, as I say, who have a greater veneration from Luther than just about any church historical figure I know, nevertheless, while seemingly devoted and considering themselves devoted to Luther are nevertheless in their Lutheranism departing from Luther at a fundamental point. I don't, they, they don't agree with that, you understand, and I think their respect, my, they don't agree with my criticism, and I think their respect for Luther is such that if they ever did accept that, they would consider themselves uh, no longer Lutherans and so on. But what I'm saying is they think they're being true to Luther even when they are slipping into the Melanchthonian way of thinking. The ultimate position, as we'll make clear, I hope, before this lecture is over, the ultimate position of the Lutherans is synergistic, not avowedly so, not obviously so, very subtly so, and in a very restrained fashion, and to most Lutherans, unrecognizably so, but nevertheless synergistic, Melanchthonian, at a point which uh, Luther would have not tolerated for a moment, and during the life of Luther, Melanchthon would never have mentioned for a moment, though bravely afterwards he expresses his feeling, but I mustn't use the word bravely, lest I give that impression as I say that Melanchthon was a kind of coward. It wasn't that. It was a real raw reverence and awe for the person, so deep that it's almost as if Melanchthon couldn't quite believe that Luther could make this kind of mistake. Luther once disappears from the scene, he's no longer here in this world actively advocating his thought, and Melanchthon, as it were, doesn't feel that irresistible pressure of Martin Luther, and he's able to express himself more. But I hope you get what I'm not articulating at all well, but I hope you get what I'm trying to say here. They, it's a kind of feeling in the presence of Luther that uh, he just can't be wrong. And though Melanchthon is convinced to the core that he is wrong, and Melanchthon is right, he can't overcome that feeling. But as soon as Luther disappears from the scene, then it's almost as if the cork is off the bottle and it pours right out, and he's able to express himself honestly uh, and confidently. Seven, out of six. After Luther's death in 46, immediately and openly, uh, Melanchthon differed and Lutheranism gradually slipped back to medieval semi-Augustinianism uh, called semi-Pelagianism. I'm using it here as synergistic and 
but it's what you recognize, as you, if you'll remember our earlier lectures, that after Augustine, the people who admired Augustine, who had the greatest influence by far in the early church, certainly before the Reformation, and I would say even after it, and so on, they couldn't quite go all the way with Augustine, and they settled for what came to be called a semi-Pelagianism, which was, you remember, a preserving for mankind, even uh, no matter what condition he was, the ability to say no to the overtures of God. And this is sort of what reappears in uh, Lutheranism that was absent from Martin Luther, namely that though the Spirit of God does the regenerating, and at that point they sound very Lutheran, at the same time, the person who is regenerated or about to be regenerated can reject the work of the Holy Spirit, and consequently, in the last analysis, man determines his destiny ultimately and not God, and you have a synergistic type of thinking, even though it's not so plain, obvious, and highly uh, developed. We have a reenactment of the earlier history of the church in Lutheranism, and once again, I remind you, my wife sometimes accuses me of being too fair to the opposition, and I do admit that when you are, try to be scrupulously fair to a viewpoint which is held differently by other people, it becomes more complicated. I could, I could be much easier understood if I just gave you the Gerstner viewpoint on this sort of a thing. You could understand it, you could accept it or reject it as the case may be, but when I say to you that what I am saying, the Lutherans don't uh, agree with, and if they did agree with it, they would recognize themselves as non-Lutheran and so on, but nevertheless, in spite of the fact that Lutherans themselves think they are faithful to Luther, this non-Lutheran says they are deeply unfaithful at this particular point of which they are not aware. They are quite Melanchthonian and not Lutheran uh, after all. Seven, there were violent criticisms of Melanchthon's little steps backward toward the Calvinistic view of the Eucharist, but little or none against his synergism, namely that God and the sinner cooperated in regeneration. Eight, after the controversies within Lutheranism settled and the Book of Concord was adopted in 1580, the Lutheran movement had become Luther-anism, not Lutherism or Lutheranism without a hyphen, a very subtle form of synergism that few recognized as such or admit to be the case. I may say this, that... Um, Part of the reason the Lutherans have had trouble with their own Lutheranism in this Reformed theologian opinion is the fact that uh, they think, many of them do, as they've expressed it in my hearing and as I've read it in books and so on, they think that Luther changed. Before he died on this subject, that admitted, they would say, in 1525, in the bondage of the will, Gerstner, you've got Luther right. That is when Luther was a thoroughgoing predestinarian. But he softened his view, and in their opinion, he changed his view, maybe slightly but significantly, uh, before he died. And so they're saying, Gerstner, or reformed historians, I don't think there's so much of a change from Luther as you imagine. Great deal of change, say, from the Luther of 1525. Not so much of a change from the Luther of 1545. Well, I say to them, and we reformed and uh, people say, where do you get the idea that Luther changed? And you can read literature of the Lutherans uh, at considerable extent and still not find any place where Luther recanted of his predestinarianism, where he actually denounced the doctrine. He said, I was mistaken in 1545. I got a heat of fury against Erasmus so much that I overextended myself. I overstated my, there's nothing like that. I have never heard tell of a Lutheran theologian who actually claims that. So we keep saying to our Lutheran friends, where do you get the idea that Luther changed? 
The only kind of evidence that I've ever seen them come up with is this. The later Luther, the later Luther, emphasized the sacraments. much more than the decrees. You see, the, the, the sacraments are something which the people receive and they choose to receive and represent some kind of faith on their part, but very definitely their activity is uh, centralized in this uh, uh, approach to the sacrament, use of the sacraments, rely and so on the sacraments. And now that is supposed to show that uh, because in his later years Luther is putting more emphasis on human activity, that he has actually changed from his divine decrees doctrine that he taught earlier. But I think any Lutheran can see very well that there could be reasons for a man's change of emphasis without any change of position being implied. It is perfectly true when you compare the life of Calvin with the life of Luther, as Calvin's life moved on, the controversies in Geneva and Bern and thereabouts turned more and more on predestination. Calvin was distressed by the fact that other parts of Switzerland were not as concerned about this fundamental biblical doctrine of predestination as he and Geneva were. Though he engaged in considerable uh, argument and controversy and insisted on the fact that this is essential doctrine. So you could actually say the older Calvin became, the more concerned he was with predestination. The older Luther became, the less occupied he was. But you see there's no change in Calvin, he just has more to say because the lay of the ground elicits it. There's no necessary change in Martin Luther, he has less to say because again the lay of the ground may not have elicited it. My point here is that no evidence that he actually recanted, that he gave it up, and this is no evidence against the fact that he believed this. It's just a simple and disputable fact that he put more emphasis on this. But to, uh, to use that as an argument against his belief in predestination, it would have to be accompanied with the evidence which is not forthcoming. That he emphasized this more because he had changed about predestination, he no longer believed it, and instead of announcing it publicly and so on, he just went to other subjects. But there, you can't prove that type of thing. And the way Luther held it earlier, you'd have to realize that if he ever did change, Luther being the man he was would certainly have stressed that fact strenuously and unmistakably. Number nine, they agreed with the Reformed up to the point that regeneration preceded faith, but then made that faith resistible, a thought alien to the mind of Martin Luther. As I was saying to you before, and you read the greatest book that Luther ever wrote, in his own opinion, and the opinion of most Luther scholars, namely The Bondage of the Will in 1525, the impression you get as you read that, even with the finesse of the argument with Erasmus and so on, on the freedom of the will, the impression you get is that Martin Luther realized in his guts that he was a sinner and only God could lift him and God did so according to a divine, uh, a divine person, a purpose uh, in his uh, life and consequently to imagine that he would change from such a thing as that to a view that uh, he could have this, this other view, you see, that man, the sinner, can actually resist regeneration. You just can't imagine Martin Luther saying a thing like that. You'd hear Martin God, if I could do it, I would have done it. I know Martin Luther well enough to know I was a core sinner. And I think all men actually are and so on. And if the Holy Spirit gave me an opportunity to resist salvation, believe me, Martin Luther would resist it. And the reason I didn't resist it is because it's irresistible. Number 10. The great Lutheran Church of the Reformation has followed Luther in his Eucharistic error and Melanchthon in his soteriological error. 
I admit that's a pretty grim estimate of a very great church of Jesus Christ. I think it's absolutely true, but please notice, if, even if it is true, that doesn't mean that those central verities which Martin Luther stressed, such as the authority of the Bible and justification by faith alone and absolute faithfulness to Jesus Christ on the part of a true Christian as he resisted the antinomian inroads that were being threatened in his time are not so. But I do feel that one has to recognize, and I plead with my Lutheran friends, especially Lutheran theologians, that they show me I'm wrong or else admit it themselves and try to rectify the situation a la Martin Luther. I think I have Martin Luther on my side here. As for, and that if I don't, I, I should be shown that I'm in error, and I trust that some Lutherans will try to do that if they think that is the case. But let me read in conclusion here, number 10 again. The great Lutheran Church of the Reformation has followed Luther in his Eucharistic error. Consubstantiation, they use different words for it, and they have different degrees of understanding and commitment to it, but that it's... It has to do with the corporeal presence of Jesus Christ in the sacrament is still as true as it was in Luther's day. And in that sense, the Lutherans are faithful to Luther. But in my opinion, it was Luther in error. And they were, have become faithful to Melanchthon in his soteriological error, namely the idea of uh, synergism, which was utterly repugnant to Martin Luther. The synergism of Melanchthon and the consubstantiationism of Luther. This is the blemish, in my opinion, of Luther's escutcheon. This is the blemish of Melanchthon's. The true Lutheran church should have seen through this error, in my opinion, and it should have seen through this error, in my opinion, and they should have agreed with Ecolampadius against Luther on this doctrine, and with Calvin and the Calvinists on this doctrine. But at the same time, my final word is, and my judgment is, that the Lutheran Church is a great church. We'll go into some detail later on in further developments where its hostility toward the Reformed Church becomes much more militant and their position much more extreme. But even after we've examined that, if I don't say it again, please remember that in my opinion, the Lutheran Church, insofar as it's true to Luther, is still a great church, though, unfortunately, still committed to two very serious errors.